Hi, I'm Jerry Gerard, and I'm not immortal, but neither are you. Hey, so I read something this week that made me kind of question the whole point of this podcast a little bit. The article talks about us having sort of two minds when it comes to thinking about dying. One is kind of a general abstract thinking about death in a general way mind, and that one is the one that probably might make us maybe change some subtle things in our behavior, or if nothing else, it would keep us on track with societal norms. We'll we'll do the right thing because it's the right thing. The other mind is the one that is triggered based on the study when you come face to face with death in a more real, tangible way, be it a health scare, be it a an injury, or you know, there's several situations. But I think when you think this is it, or this could be it, then another mind is set to work, and that one basically puts everything on the table. All the things that you think you are, all the things you believe, all the ways you behave, those all come into kind of open discussion mentally for, do I need to change any of this? And in the study, what they did was they took two groups. One of them was reminded of death just in general terms, general conversation, so that you're conscious of it. The other one had people kind of live scenarios where... They were to imagine their imminent demise. They were stuck in a room that was on fire. They were uh, in a situation where they were going to get, you know, there was a truck barreling down the road at them and they couldn't swerve. And they took the two groups and matched, and sorry, didn't match, they measured their reaction based on uh, using, they used uh, blood donations as the the measure. So they, they had two scenarios. One of them yeah, they indicated that there was a need for blood donations, but the, the need was high. There was an urgent need. And then the other one was the blood donations were needed, but it wasn't super crucial. We always need them. It's always a good thing to do. The group who was given kind of the general conscious thoughts of death in the abstract didn't change their behavior that much outside the norm. They had a control group that uh, that was given something more innocuous like, Imagine going to the dentist, which is usually not life-threatening. And the the dentist group and the people who got the general abstract concepts of death discussion didn't change their behavior. Those two groups were relatively uh, par with one another. The group who was given the visualizations about imminent demise were dramatically different from the other two groups in that they would be they were motivated to donate blood regardless of the need. So even in a low need situation, they were much more likely to give blood. So this podcast is intended to to give you, you know, general senses of trying to stay cognizant of the, the fact that we're not uh, immortal, but it wasn't supposed to scare the hell out of you. <laughs> so so that we may have to add a new segment where in the middle of it, we'll just do something terrifying so that you'll jump out of your skin and reevaluate everything. But that's probably not the best idea. So I just found that that was pretty interesting. We'll put a link to the uh, article that I read in the show notes. My guest today is uh, Jessica Onwill. And Jessica has a pretty inspiring story for someone as young as she is. She's gone through significant adversity, uh, health-related adversity. And she's not only dealt with that you know, in a in really inspiring way, but she's tried to go further and not just kind of put her own life in balance, but to try to improve the lives of others. So here's Jessica. Hey, can you hear me? Hey. So there's a very important pressing question that actually precedes any of the things we don't want to talk about. I have no idea how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> can I tell you a funny story? Yes. Not to do I, apparently. What? <laughs> So it's a Welsh name and I actually have a comedy bit on it, which I won't do right now, but (laughs) basically I was traveling in Asia and 
I met this Welsh girl and I was really excited because I thought finally someone's going to be able to pronounce my name and they don't have to ask me. And it, because my last name is like the equivalent of the last name Smith in the Western world, it's super common in over there in Wales. Really? Um, yes. And so I thought this is, this is really exciting. This is like a connecting point. And I'm telling her, I'm like, Hey, um, my last name's Welsh. Uh, it's Anwell. It's like super common. And she's like, I've never heard of that name in my life. And I kept saying it over and over again, thinking that she would click. And then I spelt it to her. I said, A-N-W-Y-L. And she goes, ah, and just like something like so (laughs) retarded. I was like, good. God, that's not my name. So, That's crazy. In fact, I was going to guess the way you said it. I was going to guess like the word anvil, like a blacksmith, but with mm-hmm. a W instead of the V. So obviously, but so when you, when you say it to people, what do you use? I just say it the way my family says it. Obviously we're so far removed from our heritage. We Which just is say like, it the way we like. That's uh, anvil, like something like that. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Okay. I'm not going to try the Welsh one. I bet you couldn't do that twice if I, if I bet you money. <laughs> Um, so, um, I, t- I asked people the same question. Uh, are you going to die? I am going to die. Yes. And just so you know, that's been a unanimous answer. You're, you're, you're batting 1000 with everyone else I've talked to. <laughs> get an A plus for that one. As much as people may try right. to think about the contrary. So the, really the more interesting question is, is that given the fact that that's probably a, uh, you know, barring crazy scientific advances, that's going to be a given, does it actually something that, that finds its way into your daily conscious thought? And if so, is it often, does it change anything for you? I wouldn't say it's a daily conscious thought. It would probably be sad if that was the case every single day. You know, I've had quite a few near death experiences for being 20 something. <laughs> and so I guess I'm reminded of those pretty often to go, Hey, am I living the life that I want to live? Can I do things differently? Am I appreciating the life that I'm living? It definitely does change. I think perspective is something that we don't have all the time. You know, we get caught up in the day to day life and sometimes that's a daily grind and we're creatures of habit you know, like most of the things we do are habitual. (laughs) And so to break out of that, I mean, for me, the warning signs are sometimes physical, like physical tension that I feel in my body. Sometimes it's emotional when I'm not feeling so good. That's the times where I reflect and go, look how good you have it. Like you're alive. And that makes me more energized to then live my life the way I want to live it. So like, <clears throat> let me give you an example. Like I'll, I'll go to the doctor and I'll get blood work done or I'll get some kind of normal checkup and they'll say, you know, I don't like this glucose number, the blood sugar number. I don't like your cholesterol. And I go, oh no, you know, I have to only eat celery for the rest of my life. And I do that for about a day. And then I think, you know, what would be good is Doritos. <laughs> and, and then I find that like, that the problem with that I have, and I don't know, if you can get the fact that these the, the actions that you take have consequences, it, it tends to be something you have a hard time sustaining. So I've never, to be frank, I've never had a near death experience. I don't think, but I mean, do those is that also something you can put on the back burner, or is it something that scary kind of always stay in the forefront? Well, in terms of health, things that you can sustain is that is that the question? Well, like I said, I mean, from my perspective, what you're, the story you're telling is scary and that if you've actually been close to you know, actually dying, I, my feeling as an outsider is that that would basically permeate my everyday thought, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe mm-hmm. you can compartmentalize even that. I don't know. Well, maybe it's because I'm super stubborn. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so when... I almost, okay, so three plus ish years ago, I almost died of septicemia, which is blood poisoning. 
And Hmm. that was a huge shock to me. I'm pretty optimistic and I was a very healthy person and I'm young. So it was a surprise. But when I came up against obstacles, even post you're going to live sort of prognosis, I always had the mentality that I was going to get better. And then as a result of reactions to certain medications, I then developed a skin condition, a gut condition, and I was unaware of the connection at the time. And so were the doctors. My initial take is like a holistic one. I really prefer to go down a route that is holistic because I, I have a lot of agency and I'm a a lot like I am very stubborn. So I like to do things my own way. But when I was struggling to control and understand my new body that I was in, because it was no longer responding the way it used to, to certain foods. And I just didn't know what to do. So I, I reached out in desperation to these doctors who then gave me medication after medication after medication. And basically within only a few months, like I was almost at my deathbed because of how adversely I was reacting to these drugs. I became allergic to all food and my face, my entire face was swollen. I didn't even look like myself. And the skin was that of a burn survivor. Mm. Just to give you like an image, it was really horrific in that I didn't even know that that would have been a possibility for me. And I was like 40 kilos, adversely reacting to all food, like actually terrified. Now, I never want to experience that again. (laughs) But that was like me losing complete control. And similarly, we can't control that we, whether we will ultimately live or die, I guess in answer to your question, for me, like the stakes are so high that I will do anything that it takes to reverse what I was going through. Hopefully no one else has to create stakes in their life that severe in order to create change. But I was told that I would absolutely never get better. Mm. And And how are you now, if I don't mind me asking? Great. Oh, that's great. I yeah. mean, like I said, and this, this, I'm guessing this is in, in, defer- in defiant rather of the doctors because they didn't think you would get better. Good for you. Bad for them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And they don't care that I've gotten better, like zero curiosity about how or why, which is a little bit sad. But yes, I feel like maybe that, you know, it may not, may not be possible for everyone. But I think if you can put your mind to something and you are determined enough, you'll do whatever it takes. Hearing your story and, and, and knowing what I know of you as a person today, it's amazing that you don't have more of a tinge of, you know, kind of a walking bitterness or a walking kind of life has dealt me a bad hand and, and I'm basically going to be angry about it. I'm, so, I'm just amazed at the difference between your demeanor and the ordeal. And, and maybe that stubbornness can be turned into determination and can be determined into perseverance or maybe there's a, maybe there's a more positive spin on the term stubborn, but I mean, <laughs> I just out of curiosity, I don't know how you do it. Like, do you, how did you actually get to that point? Yeah. Well, no doubt. I hated myself. I hated my life. I was completely isolated my struggle was that I wasn't good at asking for help my whole life. I've been used to dealing with things on my own, very independent, very precociously independent child. It got to the point where I had to ask for help and that was really difficult. And despite almost dying a few times and, and wanting to live, I did get to a point where I thought I couldn't do this anymore. So in those moments, realizing that there is a world full of people who are here on this planet to help. And it is such a gift to someone when they are asked for help. And that's like, I feel purposeful and 
excited when I can be generous, when I can give to someone who really needs me. But I just didn't see it that way back then. And and so it was very, very hard for me. And obviously when it's hard for you, you should start with someone you very much trust, not just the world. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But it was very much a process of me taking it one day at a time, allowing people into my life, being vulnerable, being seen physically. I mean, I was hidden for three months. I didn't leave the house. Like that Mm. does something to someone and it's not positive. (laughs) And I think we all have a degree of shame. I had a very, very deep shame because I was physically monstrous. I looked scary. People in the street would either stare, gasp or divert their gaze towards me. Mm. And it's and obviously it's it's absolutely you know, not a single thing you can do about it. It just happened to you, but now you're basically bearing the brunt of that, which is it's heartbreaking. I mean, it's also inspiring from my perspective because, like I said, I just find you to be a much an incredibly positive person. So you know, I also know about the, what you're doing now with regard to your photography, and I wonder how much of that ordeal actually informed you know what you're what you're doing now. I would say it's everything. My photography is so much more than the photos. It's about redefining beauty and how you see yourself. It's about being raw and vulnerable and being seen. I mean, that is truly what healed me from the inside out and being able to accept myself the way I am is what allowed me to transform myself in a positive way. You know, like I'm definitely the kind of person who automatically wants to double down when there's a challenge and just go harder, faster, stronger. (laughs) But I realized that was killing me literally. So to take space and to one, appreciate what you do have, even if that's something really small right now. And And I guess give yourself a break, Mm. you know, where it's funny. I feel like there's an, there's almost an irony in it when you are kind to yourself, because I used to hate myself when you are kind to yourself. And when you see yourself for who you truly are, which is a magnificent, beautiful human being, you can have more fun in the process. You have more energy about the process. You're more creative. And you can do more, but when you're constantly trying to force yourself to do more, you do less and you crumble, right? Yeah, I, I think you're right. You had mentioned when we had talked prior about um, feedback you'd gotten from other women who had gone through more traditional photography sessions for various purposes. Yes. Can, can you recount that, do you mind? Sure. Traditional photography, it's set up very differently. You know, you've got the hair, the makeup, the studio, the lights. The photographer has preconceived notions of what you should look like. They project an idea of beauty onto you. I say idea because, and not ideal, because I really don't think it's ideal for everyone to look the same or beautiful for that matter, for everyone to look the same. I find it, I think it's boring for everyone to look the same. But the thing is, when that happens, when you are made up to look like someone different than yourself, it doesn't make you feel good. You then are comparing yourself to an image of yourself that isn't real, that doesn't match the image in the mirror, And so you're comparing yourself now to yourself and thinking, why doesn't that look like me? Is that what I should be? And it creates this really awful disparity. And that image isn't necessarily what's beautiful. But with raw photography, it's like, okay, let's capture you. Let's capture you in the moments where you are yourself in those moments where you're talking passionately about something, in those moments where you're vulnerable, when you're 
excited, when you're creatively self-expressive, like all these little moments that make you beautiful. It's funny because we project this idea of beauty onto ourselves that is completely physical and superficial. But when you ask someone, Jerry, why do you think, for instance, your best friend is beautiful? The adjectives to, that come to mind, mind are completely personal. You know, she's generous. She's, you know, she's passionate. I love the way she does this or I love the way he does that. It has nothing to do with the physical. It's quite remarkable. Yeah, you're right. As people see the photographs you've taken for the first time, what, what kind of reactions have you gotten? Because I'm guessing this is views they've never seen of themselves before. Yes. Sometimes it's like, wow, I can't believe. And they almost choke up saying like, I've never seen myself as beautiful. I've never liked a photo of me before. And it's so refreshing to see myself the way that I do see myself. It makes me really happy to see them see themselves differently. The, 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 big, the big tragedy I just realized is that you could never be your own client. <laughs> Not true. Oh, no? That photo you've seen of me is a self-portrait. Ah, okay. So I guess the modern camera technology allows you to be photographer and subject. I never would have thought to have done that, but one of my clients, she was like, you, trans like, you transformed me. Like my self-talk has changed. Have you ever thought of taking a photo of yourself? And I thought, no. Horrifying with a skin condition, but also a little bit contradictory. Like I should, I should do that. I would love to do that. Kind of. It's scary. And it's meant to be scary. And that's when the biggest change takes place. So I, I did. I took a photo of me completely barefaced when my skin condition was a lot worse than it is now. For me, it was like owning, like another level of owning who I was and what I looked like and that that was just so okay to be that way, that I didn't have to wear makeup. And I talk about this anyway, but it was just another level seeing myself that way. You know what was great is some days when my skin would get worse. And I think as humans, when we see ourselves regress a little bit, we automatically kind of resist it and kind of hate it. On those days where I saw myself a little bit worse, I could see that red faced girl in the mirror from my photo and I would smile and that would dissipate. Those negative feelings would dissipate. So it's powerful. The one thing I would wonder there are, I mean, not that we wish this on anyone, but there are other people who are going through difficult times physically right now. Is there anything from your experience that you could basically say to that person that would be of any solace or any basically help from the other side from where you are now? I would say whatever you're feeling is real. It's valid. Don't run away from it because that feeds shame and you have nothing to be ashamed about. What you're going through is real and it is human. And maybe one day it'll be a beautiful part of your story. It doesn't define who you are and things can get better. And one more piece of advice for someone who encounters someone with a, any kind of physical issue, what advice would you give them? Because I think one of the things that we all do, and I, I put myself in this category, is sometimes we think that by looking away or by you know, avoiding, we think we're basically being polite, but sometimes that could be adverse, I would suspect. So what would you say to somebody as the best way to engage productively and, and compassionately? Treat them as a human. You know, look them in the eye, say hello, don't act differently. Just be who you would always be. Don't pity them. No one wants to be pitied. That's yuck. You know, don't assume that they have, they have a bad life. I actually, I, I met this um, woman uh, last night who identifies as disabled and she's very physically different. She's in a wheelchair and sometimes it's difficult to hear what she's saying, but she's like this phenomenal human and she's writing, she's a writer and she said to me, I don't know whether my story is worth sharing because everyone assumes that someone with a disability 
has a crap life, but I love my life. Does anyone actually want to hear that? And I got so excited. I was like, you have to tell that story because everyone just assumes and projects their own insecurities and ideas of how they want their life to be onto other people. And it's very disempowering, actually. It's actually hurtful to someone's self-esteem to, for you to think that their life should be any different or that your life is better than theirs. So yeah, just to, just to treat them like you would your mom or your best friend, just say, Hey, that's really inspiring stuff for someone as young as she is. I highly recommend that you go to her website. I have the link to in the show notes. The pictures are unbelievable. Coming up with such a creative way to kind of move the world forward uh, in the face of the things that she's gone through is pretty inspiring. You can uh, subscribe to Not Immortal wherever you follow normal podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, pretty much anywhere. Uh, follow me on uh, Jerry Gerard at Terry Gerard on Twitter. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you next time.